So we were we were just finishing up with the thyroid hormones. We know uh, a little bit about T3, T4 action. There's a third thyroid hormone that is generated, and this is called calcitonin. And calcitonin is actually very active in kids, or much more active in little kids. It helps to regulate them. the mechanism of action for calcitonin is to regulate bone deposition. Yes, this is a third thyroid hormone. We've already talked about T3 and T4, and, uh, T4. calcitonin related to bone deposition. It's more active than kids. All right, uh, the next gland that we need to talk about here is the parathyroid gland. And the parathyroid glands, these are going to be located on the uh, back of the thyroid itself. These are four little spots, typically normal anatomy, four little spots of unique tissue that produces a hormone called parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is going to be involved in calcium regulation. It increases blood calcium levels. Now again, this is really, really fast. I'm not really giving each of these glands justice. Uh, they do much more than just the things that I'm kind of highlighting, but these are their main hormone mechanisms of action. The adrenal glands. I mean, it would be beneficial to read on it, of course, but um, I'm giving you the major functions, okay? So the adrenal glands, and we actually have to break the adrenal glands up just a little bit because the adrenal glands are actually going to have two different layers. You have the adrenal medulla, and we'll, that's where we'll start is with the medulla, which is the tissue that is in the middle. And the adrenal medulla is going to be the site of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine production. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. You'll recognize these as being what class of hormone? These are all, starts with an M, monoamines. <laughs> okay, so the mono, these are the monoamines that are being produced by the adrenal medulla, and they're going to prepare the organism for action. So when you think of in terms of fight or flight, these are the hormones that are being produced. The adrenal medulla, in some degree, is, in, uh, is going to be uh, regulating this response. We're getting ready to either run away from the bear on campus or to try to beat up the bear on campus. Choose run. Don't choose beat up. <laughs> now the outer layer of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal cortex, and the cortex is actually going to produce a unique milieu of hormones. And primarily what we're getting here are things like the glucocorticoids and the mineral corticoids. We're going to get specifically a hormone called aldosterone. And aldosterone is going to act 
on the kidneys to help regulate ion balance. This is going to have a direct result on regulating blood pressure. Okay, so aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex, interacts with the kidney tissue to help the kidney or to signal to the kidney to change the amount of ions that are being removed from the bloodstream with a net result of blood pressure being regulated. The cortex is also going to produce a couple hormones that are related to uh, fat metabolism and protein metabolism. One is cortisol, the other one is corticosterone. So these are going to be produced and they will help to regulate fat and protein metabolism. So fat and protein metabolism. Now we have one additional hormone that's being produced by the um, adrenal cortex. And that molecule is DHEA. And if you're up on any of the ergogenic aids, especially ergogenic aids that were used back in the 1980s and the 1990s in Olympians, the German, women German swim team used DHEA in the 1980 Olympics. And if you know anything about German women swimmers from 1980, you will think that they were probably all men. <laughs> and the reason is, is because they were using this hormone, which is a precursor of testosterone. It's, not it's highly illegal. <laughs> so DHEA, and the full name of DHEA is dihydroepiandosterone. So DHEA for obvious reasons. Endocrinologists are lazy and they don't like to spell everything out. Okay, the pancreas. Pancreas is a really unique organ and there's a picture here of the pancreas and you can see that it's directly interfaced to the duodenum, which is a portion of the small intestine just distal from the stomach. And the cross-sectional tissue makeup of the pancreas is to have two different types of tissue. And you can see those two different types of tissues uh, illustrated in this figure. You have these endocrine portions of the cell, uh, I'm sorry, of the pancreas, which are called the islets of Langerhans or the pancreatic islets. And then you have the other tissue that is more glandular, and that is acinar tissue which is actually going to not be endocrine, but rather exocrine. So it's a gland, produces a substance, dumps it into a duct, and you can see that that duct empties into the, into the duodenum, to the small intestine. It's emptying through this thing called the common bile duct. This is also uh, just uh, not far away from where the bile is produced in the gallbladder at the base of the liver. And so this is going to be an exocrine function involved in digestion. In, in particular, breakdown of things like protein uh, from your meals. But we're interested in the endocrine function, so we're interested in the pancreatic islands. Okay, so the pancreatic islands. Now, why are they called an islet? Well, because they resemble a small island in the sea of the acinar tissue. This island, or the pancreatic islet, is going to be composed of five different types of cells. Now, we want to look at these in a little bit higher detail. So, from the last image to this image, this is going to be one individual islet surrounded by that acinar cell, the exocrine acinus. And you can see the varied colors represent the individual cells that are there. Now, each of these cells they're not really that much difference in appearance. What they are different in is what hormone is actually being produced. Okay, So the five cells, we have names for them. We're going to break them down 
by name and identify the hormone that would be produced. So one of the cells in here is called the alpha cell. And the alpha cells produce a hormone called glucagon. Glucagon, when released into the bloodstream, basically has the reverse reaction of insulin. And so this is going to actually result in an increase in blood glucose. So glucagon enters the bloodstream, and glucose should shortly follow. The second cell type are the beta cells, and these are cells that you are going to be most familiar with because these produce the very well-known hormone insulin. Insulin is responsible to reduce blood glucose levels. So really, throughout the day, the alpha cells and the beta cells are in a dance, releasing glucagon, releasing insulin to help regulate how much blood glucose levels are in circulation. And this is very important. We want to stay between 80 and 120 deci uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter for normal homeostatic physiological function. Now, the dance, it's got to be chaperoned, just like your dances in high school. And it's going to be chaperoned by the delta cells. And the delta cells produce a hormone called somatostat. You may recognize this from hypothalamic pituitary hormone physiology. Somatostatin is basically an inhibitor of growth hormone. In this case, the somatostatin is actually going to help to regulate the insulin and the glucagon release. So somatostatin is going to be responsible to regulate that's probably not very acceptable. Let's try that again. There we go. So regulates glucagon, insulin, dance. Basically regulates their release so that insulin doesn't become overly powerful and glucagon doesn't become overly powerful. And really, we're just focused here on maintaining those normal homeostatic levels of glucose in the range that will be conducive for good physiological function. The fourth type of cell is called the PP cell, or also frequently referred to as the F cell. And on this figure, you can see it labeled as the F cell there. It's probably easier to remember the PP cell because it stands for uh, pancreatic polypeptide, which is going to be the hormone that's produced by this uh, pancreatic islet cell. PPFF? It's PP, that's supposed to be or. Sorry. PP. So the cell can be called a PP cell or it can be called an F cell and it produces hormone pancreatic polypeptide. And pancreatic polypeptide is going to be a inhibitor of some digestive functions. an inhibitor of digestive function. The last pancreatic islet cell is a G cell, and the G cell, cell is a cell that produces a hormone called gastrin. Produces gastrin. And gastrin is actually going to have the opposite effect of pancreatic polypeptide. So gastrin is going to be a enhancer of digestive function. So really, in effect, the pancreas, in, in, in the endocrine portion of the pancreas, is dealing with 
handling met metabolic activity. We're dealing with glucose levels in the bloodstream, and then we're dealing with digestion um, and, and digestive function. Yes. Going back to um, blood glucose level, it's milligrams per deciliter. So the measure of blood glucose is going to be milligrams per deciliter. All right. The ovaries, again, female reproductive endocrine gland. Produce an estrogen called estradiol. Uh, in particular, it's 17 beta estradiol. And estradiol, what you can see going on here is we have two types of cells that are going to be found in the ovarian tissue granulosa cells and fecal cells. Cholesterol is biochemically converted into androstene dione by or when luteinizing hormone binds to the luteinizing hormone receptor. Where is luteinizing hormone coming from, by the way? The ant pit, anterior pituitary. So luteinizing hormones release, it's one of our gonadotropins, produced by a gonadotroph in the anterior pituitary, releases into the bloodstream, binds to luteinizing hormone receptor on the fecal cells in the ovary, upregulates the production of androstene dione from cholesterol. Then androstene dione is going to be released through a paracrine function or paracrine interaction and is going to be taken up by the granulosa cells where it is going to be enhanced to be converted into estrone, one of our estrogens, by the actions of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. Where is that being released from? anterior pituitary, our other gonadotropin. Then we have a couple enzymatic conversions that occur where estrogen can be converted into estradiol. Estradiol is then going to be released into the bloodstream and will have a variety of different effects. Now, the effects that estradiol can have after it's been produced, it is related to female reproductive development. It helps to, after that female reproductive development has occurred, regulate menstruation. Okay, you ready? So it helps to regulate menstruation. It's going to help in the progression, progresses pregnancy. It will prep the mammary glands or the mammary tissue for lactation. Because of who I am, I also believe, based off my own investigation, that it may regulate physical activity levels in both animals and in humans. Now, estrogen is not just produced by the ovaries. It's actually also produced at some levels in males as well. Uh, and it's being produced primarily um, uh, as a result of testosterone production. Uh, once testosterone is released from the testes, it interacts with the adipose tissue. Adipose tissue has presence of an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase takes that testosterone and converts it into 17-beta estradiol. In males, all of these primarily, with the exception of number five, are, are primarily related to, to females. In males, especially during embryogenesis, there is a flood of estrogen. And that flood of estrogen is primarily because babies are, are growing up in a uterine environment, which is an estrogen-based environment. Internal estrogen levels are going to be high during pregnancy. So both males and females are actually going to be um, subjected to estrogen levels. 
Now, the interesting thing is that those estrogen molecules are actually bound up in a protein called fetal alpha feto alpha binding protein. And it basically is a binding, sex hormone binding globulin that reduces the effects of estrogen. So female babies or female embryos have very low estrogen levels because it's all trapped up inside of uh, the fetal alpha binding protein. Males have very low levels of the same estrogen because of the same reason, but they're producing higher levels of testosterone because of the presence of uh, testicular tissue. That testicular tissue is producing testosterone that then crosses the blood-brain barrier, and in the brain, aromatase converts testosterone into estrogen. And in males, it is estrogen that actually masculinizes the brain, especially the hypothalamus, so that we go from having a 28-day cyclical release of our luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone to a 24-hour pulsatile release of luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. So there's a fun factoid. Uh, trivia night, what masculinizes the male brain? It's estrogen, it is not testosterone. The ovaries, kind of getting back to the topic here, also produce a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is also going to be involved in a different portion, but involved in the same in the regulation of menstruation. It is actually progesterone. We need a spike in progesterone to establish a pregnancy. So once we have fertilization that has actually occurred, if we don't have a spike in progesterone levels, that fertilized ovum, has no place to implant, and it actually is just going to be what, in medical terms, they call a spontaneous abortion. You might call it an unknown miscarriage, because typically it's happening so early within the, uh, we're talking about four or five days after fertilization, there is no signs of pregnancy at that point. So progesterone levels have to spike and remain high to end up causing a series of endocrine events to occur that result in thickening and maintained thickening of the uterine lining for successful establishment of pregnancy. Progesterone is also, uh, alongside estrogen, going to be uh, important in the preparation of our mammary tissue for lactation. Okay, so the ovaries are producing Estrogen, they're producing, and really I should say are producing estrogens because they're producing things like estrone and estradiol, and there's actually a third one called estriol. All of these are estrogens that are helping to regulate some of the reproductive physiology and possibly some other physiological, outside of the reproduction system, physiological uh, events. Progesterone, estrogen being produced. There's also a hormone called inhibin. Inhibin is going to be produced by the ovaries as well. And what inhibin does, its name actually is sort of a giveaway. You would think, oh, it probably inhib inhibits something, and it does. It is going to inhibit follicle-stimulating hormone secretion. So there's going to be times when we don't want to have follicle-stimulating hormone having any sort of action. So through a negative feedback loop, we're actually going to release inhibin during those time periods from the ovaries to circulate back onto the anterior pituitary to inhibit FSH secretion. Okay, final endocrine gland here, these are going to be the testes. Now the, test, the, the, the testes are going to produce primarily testosterone, but they actually do, uh, in some cases, produce a few other hormones as well, or are going to result in the production of a few other hormones.
Okay, so testosterone, what are some of the things that happen here with testosterone production? We are going to have things happening that relate to male reproductive development. Development of the musculoskeletal tissue. Testosterone is going to be very important for spermatogenesis, which is sperm production. Also important in the male sex drive or libido. And then it appears that it is also very much related to physical activity. Sex drive or libido. It's yeah, so that's the word there, L I B I D O. Oh. Or libido. So sex drive, also known as libido. And then they regulate physical activity. Now higher than normal levels of testosterone have been associated with aggression, higher rates of criminal activity. Um, so there's there's obviously some other possible uh, events that can happen uh, with this as well. Now, most of the time, testosterone, similar to the estrogens, is actually going to um, cause a lot of transcription events to occur. So we have androgen response elements that we can find in a variety of different genes. And those AREs are going to be where testosterone and other testosterone-derived molecules, such as dihydrotestosterone, can bind through the androgen receptor to that, uh, that structure or the DNA in that area, and it causes genes to be produced that then we get a protein that has some sort of androgenic effect. Now, it shouldn't really surprise you that we also have inhibin that's produced here and does the exact same thing. As we saw from the ovaries, it's going to inhibit FSH secretion from the anterior pituitary. And then finally, again, just to have it in your notes, because it is rather interesting and maybe a little bit unexpected, testosterone that's produced by the testes is released into the bloodstream, interacts with the um, adipose tissue and some other tissues, including the brain tissue, to be converted into estrogen through the aromatase enzyme complex. And this results in the masculinization of the male brain. In fact, it's pretty interesting. They've done studies in rats before. Let me just finish this up and then I'll tell you a story. So the estrogen is going to be aromatized from testosterone. So they've done studies in rats before where they've actually knocked out the estrogen, um, the estrogen surge in the uh, embryo, embryogenic rats or, or mice. So embryogenesis is occurring in these rats and mice, and they prevent estrogen levels from getting very high. And what results is they actually have a male mouse. He's phenotypically male, meaning he has all of the male sexual organs, but acts very much female. And if you put him in, cage, in cages with a normal rat, a normal male rat, the uh, um, feminized rat will actually perform a, a uh, behavior called lordosis, where basically um, they get down very low and they expose where the uh, female reproductive organs are supposed to be. So basically looking for um, um, basically uh, insertion and um, intercourse to occur. Uh, they will actually um, also exhibit high levels of shopping if you put a belk in their cage or a, a ball in their cage, the uh. <laughs> everyone's like, wow. 
<laughs> nope, that was a joke. Doesn't happen. <laughs> All right, so that's all I'm going to have time to talk about on the endocrine system, which it really hurts because I love the endocrine system. It's my favorite system, physiological system. But we are going to move on. Uh, we're actually just a touch ahead of schedule, which is probably an OK thing. So we're going to start a brand new lecture here. In fact, I'll even, as long as everybody has this, we'll get a fresh page. We're not really going to go into any of, any of that detail um, specifically. We just don't really have a whole lot of time for, for those types of discussions. You'll get a little bit of that in the lab. Yeah. That adrenal syndrome within our blood, how does that happen? Like, are they breaking up? Do they have the female organs or that kind of thing? Um, so the adrenal gland can produce testosterone, mm -hmm. and when it begins to produce too high of levels of testosterone, you begin to go through some masculinization events. And honestly, I, I don't know a whole lot about the syndrome, but it can occur in a couple different time points within life. Most of the time, I think it's actually occurring after development, so we're talking about you know people have already been born, they're 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 going through um, adolescence and things like that, and they're it, it might be a, a tumor that is in the adrenal uh, adrenal gland that begins to produce higher levels of testosterone, and they just begin to exhibit some of those male characteristics. Um, they yeah, they typically will have the female reproductive parts. Uh, they'll be genetically female. They just have some abnormal physiology where they begin to have the adrenal gland basically acting like a testicle or a tes testicular tissue. Is that like a like a thing like Well, I mean, yeah, I, w I would I would think so. Um, it's probably somewhat genetic and. I guess not to go into too much detail here, just for sake of time, it's my personal belief that probably Adam and Eve before the fall had perfect genetics. Their genomes were without blemish. And as a result of the fall, just like all of creation is basically reeling from those effects, I think human genome is also the genetics of all organisms are also affected by that. And so, and, and I mean, you, gosh, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, there's scripture that talks about the sins of the father will be out to the third and even the fourth generation and it you just think oh, okay it's probably some cultural or you know you have some effect some psychological effect we actually be, are beginning to realize that that happens biologically as well and if you have a mother or a grandmother let's start there if you have a grandmother who smokes it changes this thing called the epigenome which is basically these uh, chemical orientation, um, chemical molecules, and the, the, the way that they are organized on the nucleotides of the DNA. And they actually are going to be altered by things like smoking and things like drinking. And they are associated, changes in the epigenome is associated with certain types of disease. So if grandma smoked, she has an alteration of her epigenome, can pass that off to your mom, who will pass it off to you. And so now all of a sudden, smoking and consumption of alcohol and drugs and these bad behaviors, so to speak, are affecting two and three and four generations out. It's pretty weird. So yeah, absolutely. I think that things like that are even rates of cancer. Right now, when I was, when I was in college, um, which wasn't really all that long ago, but I graduated in 2002 with my undergraduate degree. So what is that, 12 years ago? Well, 13 years ago now? When we were going through cancer and studying cancer as undergraduate students, for men, and, and I only really remember what we were talking about because from, from the perspective of men, since I'm male, rates of cancer at that time were one in five. Which is, I mean, 20% of the male population is gonna have cancer. And this was 15 years ago. It's not one in two. So, I mean, there's no other men in here, so I'm probably gonna get cancer at some point in my life which is crazy to think of. So yeah, absolutely. I think not only is the genome 
being affected, but it's, and, and we get these really strange diseases that make absolutely no sense whatsoever, um, but it seems to be accelerating. And some people are like, oh, it's because we've gone through industrialization and we know how to treat chronic uh, or uh, uh, um, infectious diseases much more effectively now, because it used to be 100 years ago, if you got a cold, it could kill you, and now we don't die from colds. And, and the cold is probably not a great example, but influenza. There are very few people who die from influenza every year. We've had a few this year because of the switch in the, the mutation that was unexpected in the, in the flu virus, and we only really matched with the flu vaccine about 20%. So there's been some death this year, but most of the time there's very, very few um, very few deaths from influenza, but it used to be a major killer back 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And people are going, well, we just know how to manage those diseases, so everybody's not getting older, and so now they're getting cancer because that's an old age disease. Well, we are past the pinnacle of human aging. Every generation going forward we're expecting is going to have a, less, a lower and lower life expectancy. About 78 to 79 year, years, years old for your parents' generation and, and their parents' generation. For you, it's probably going to be closer to 76 years old. Why is that? Well, is it because our genome is no longer as perfect as it was 100 years ago or closer to being perfect as it was 100 years ago and somehow we're falling to that effect? It's possible. So yeah, I think that disease, and I mean, I'm taking too much time here, but it's interesting, right? Why does a virus exist? It probably didn't cause disease 6,000 years ago, but it probably existed because God created all things in existence. It's not like a virus just evolved out of something else. It's probably viruses have probably existed for a long time. But now viruses, I mean, most of the illnesses that we have are results of microbes, including viruses. Why is that? The only thing I can come up with to explain that is we're now beginning to realize that we can use viruses as vectors to deliver medicine really effectively. In other words, I can take a cancer therapeutic and I can put it into a virus and I can target to a specific tissue. So I'm not having to give these huge doses that are just general doses that cause a lot of problems. Doxorubicin is a cancer drug. And it's a really great effective cancer drug. It gets rid of cancer if you give a high enough dose, but it ends up giving you heart disease, mm -hmm. chronic heart failure, and even acute heart failure. So it destroys your heart, but you're cancer free, but the heart disease is going to get you. What if we could deliver doxorubicin directly to the cancer cells that we needed to? And I think we probably are going to be able to do that in the next 20 years with viral vectors. We load doxorubicin up into a virus, or we produce doxorubicin genes in viruses that target directly to certain areas of the body where we have high levels of cancer, and we give this effective straight-up dose of doxorubicin in that area, and we eliminate the effects of, uh, on the heart, and we protect our, our hearts. We have car a much higher level of cardio protection. And then we couple that with exercise, and it's even more effective cancer treatment. That's the only explanation I can give for that, and I don't know why I just went there, since it's very unrelated to what uh, the class is about, but there you go. Some, something free for the day. All right, let's talk about the circulatory system. So you're going to want to start a brand new lecture here. Circulatory system is going to be comprised of three tissues. Or three types of organs. You're going to include things like the heart, the vessels, and the blood. So the heart and the vessels are organs, and the blood is the tissue. So expect to see these three types of organs and tissues shown up for discussion. Now, 
just like all of the other physiological systems that we've talked about, since this is a biology-based class, we like to divide things up and categorize stuff. The circulatory system is the proper name for the physiological system. The organ system is known as the circulatory system. A lot of you maybe have heard of systems called the, uh, a system called the cardiovascular system. And you would think, oh, that must be analogous to the circulatory system. Incorrect. Really what it is, is that's one of the divisions of the circulatory system. So what this is, or what this um, division is comprised of, is the cardiovascular. So the heart and the vascular or the vessels. So that's one of our divisions. And then there is a second division making up the circulatory system. And this is going to be the hematological division. Which is going to comprise of the tissue known as blood. Okay, so our circulatory system is going to provide three general functions. And those three general functions, one is going to be transport. And what we mean by transport is the blood is going to dissolve things like oxygen and other nutrients and carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes, hormones, stem cells. And all of these things are going to be transported around the organism to all of the places that we need to transport oxygen and nutrients and carbon dioxide and places that we need to remove waste. Okay, so transport of a variety of different molecules and substances. The circulatory system is also going to provide protection. The circulatory system is involved in a process known as inflammation, which is a higher level of blood flow to the site of injury or infection. What is that after metabolic waste? It's metabolic waste, hormones, and stem cells. CO2, carbon dioxide. So protection. The protection uh, mechanisms of the circulatory system increase blood flow to sites of injury or uh, in, um, um, inflama uh, infection. It's going to be called inflammation. The blood also is involved in the destruction of foreign material or foreign particles. It's the location of antibody production and circulation and also will aid in clotting. Okay, so all protective. Some of it's immune system and related to the immune system and provides that immune protection. And some of it, blood clotting, is just simply to prevent large losses of, uh, of, of blood from the organism. Now, the last major function, the circulatory system is going to be heavily involved in regulation. And the things that are going to be regulated, the blood is going to regulate where fluid ends up. We're going to call that fluid distribution. So fluid distribution. The blood is also um, organized to contain organized to contain a series of enzymes that help out with buffering the pH. And in fact, we're going to find that's a function of the red blood cell. And then helps to regulate body temperature. And we've already seen that in some degree. Um, we know that the blood is going to be circulated towards the surface of the skin where heat is going to be removed into sweat that's going to evaporate um, or transpire off of the skin surface. 
So transportation, protection, and regulation are three of the general functions for the circulatory system. So in this introductory material to the circulatory system, I want to briefly just talk about each of these different components. And we're going to begin with what I'm going to call component number one, which is going to be our blood. Now blood, um, pretty interesting material. It is considered to be a tissue, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But anyone happen to know in adults how much blood we actually have? Four to six liters. So you have four to six liters of blood. So really think about three two liter Coke bottles. That's all you got. Which really for the whole volume of your body, that's that's not a whole heck of a lot of blood. So blood needs to be well maintained and it needs to be distributed very um, judiciously, so to speak. We need to distribute that blood where it is absolutely needed. So yeah, blood is considered a tissue, but it's considered to be a liquid tissue. And all that really means, again, a tissue is going to be comprised of things like cells and extracellular matrix. I'm going to abbreviate that ECM. So it's a tissue because it does have cells. It has both white blood cells and red blood cells, and it has that extracellular matrix. It just so happens that the extracellular matrix is just a high water containing extracellular matrix. So things like bone and nervous system, the ECM has much lower concentrations of water. Here we have much higher concentrations of water. Now in all reality, the cells that are present in blood tissue is actually better described as formed elements. And I'll explain what this really means um, here in just a second. So cells and extracellular matrix uh, define blood as being a tissue, but let's call the cells formed elements. Why am I calling them form elements and not just cells? Well, because we have red blood cells and white blood cells that are both cells. And then we have this really unique fragment. We basically have a cell that has been broken apart into small little cellular fragments that no, no longer really acts as a cell, and those are called thrombocytes. You may also know those as platelets. So because of the presence of platelets, we don't just have cells. We have cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and then the torn up pieces of cell called a platelet, and so we're going to just simply refer to that whole collection of cells and platelets formed elements. So histologically, if we take a look at blood, you're going to see that there's a variety of different types of cells that are going to be present. Uh, and so you have the true red blood cells, which are these sort of discoid shaped cells, and then you have uh, a variety of different white blood cells, and we're going to talk about those in more detail. And then we have just these small little fragments, and you can see a few of these small fragments that make up the platelets. Now, one of the most common ways in which blood is utilized in health fields is to collect a whole blood sample. And to take that whole blood sample and to submit it to a centrifuge. Now, a centrifuge is a laboratory tool that we utilize that spins things really, really fast. And when we do that, when we apply centrifugal forces, heavier objects move further out away from the middle of the rotor or the spinning uh, utensil, and lighter things remain closer towards the higher levels of centrifugal force. We will pick up here on Monday talking about whole blood sample, what, what it means, what this actually uh, uh, represents in uh, a centrifuge sample of whole blood.